Okay, so let's just take a look at qualitatively a couple of examples from sports of the force of air resistance, specifically what happens when you throw or kick a football, and then secondly, what happens if you throw a baseball. Okay, so first of all, the football. The football is a highly symmetrical object, and it's an example of what is called an ellipsoid. Okay, let's describe the moments of inertia, the rotational inertia of a football. Now, I'm not going to derive it here. I'm just going to state the expressions. Okay, so football, rotational inertia. Okay, let me go ahead and draw it in three dimensions like so. Let me position the football like this. Like so, you have to think here three-dimensionally. Kind of like that. Okay, and then we have two axes here associated with the football. Okay, this distance from here to here, which is also from here to here. This is referred to as A. And then from here to here, and also from here to here, this distance is referred to as B. Okay, and then we have the z-axis, the x-axis, and the y-axis. Okay, first of all, the rotational inertia about the z-axis. That is, if you throw the football or kick the football such that it spirals, like so. Okay, the rotational inertia about the z-axis is two-fifths m times b squared, where b is, once again, this distance here or this distance here. However, if you take the football and you rotate it about either the x-axis or the y-axis, notice that the rotational inertias will be the same because of symmetry. So here's the z-axis like so, here's the x-axis like this, and then here's the y-axis like this. Notice that the rotational inertia about the x-axis and the rotational inertia about the y-axis is gonna be the same. Okay, so ix, is equal to i y and the quantity the equation that describes it is as follows it's one fifth m b squared times the quantity one plus a squared over b squared like so where a is greater than b notice that what you end up with here then therefore is in the parentheses is a number that is greater than one so because this number is greater than the one, this then means that ix or iy is greater than iz. So therefore ix, which is equal to iy, is greater than iz. Incidentally, the football does not obey perpendicular axis theorem. In football, this is an example, by the way, of what is called an ellipsoid. It does not obey perpendicular axis theorem. Okay, now take a look at these different rotational inertias. So for example, IZ. IZ like so, two-fifths mb squared is smaller. It's a smaller rate rotational inertia than ix or iy. So in other words, recall that the greater the rotational inertia, the greater the tendency to remain at a constant angular velocity. So this then kind of leads to a paradox. When you throw a football or when you punt a football, why should you try to spiral the football? Well, if you spiral the football like so, Notice that the cross-sectional area of the football that's passing through the air is smaller than if you kick the football as a field goal, for example, or on a kickoff, and it rotates like this through the air. When it rotates like this through the air, there's a bigger cross-sectional area to the football that is subjected to the force of air resistance. In other words, the drag coefficient exerted upon the football when it's doing something like this is actually a lot bigger than when it's spiraling like so. So even though it has a smaller rotational inertia when it's spiraling as opposed to wobbling, say something like this, it will actually travel through the air much more easily in this manner because the force of air resistance acting upon the football when you spiral like so is much less than if it's wobbling like so, even though the rotational inertia, IZ, is less than IX or IY. 
So this tells you then why, as a quarterback, for example, why you always want to spiral the football. So the force of air resistance exerted upon it is going to be small. However, the force of air resistance, of course, is there. So then therefore, if you don't spiral it very tightly, this then means that the football is going to start to wobble like this as it's going through the air like so. Notice that it's actually processing. There is a torque that's exerted on the football when you throw it a little bit, not quite so perfectly, if you will, as a spiral, and it then does something like this. Well, that torque that's exerted upon it is due to air resistance, of course, and this then causes the football to process. Okay, now as a punter, why do you want to try to spiral the football off your foot when you punt it? Well, if you spiral it off your foot, like so, the force of air resistance exerted upon it is going to be smaller than if you kicked it like this. Therefore, it's going to remain in the air longer. It's going to very nearly trace out a parabola, in other words, as a projectile, instead of very quickly falling to the ground like so, if you kick it such that it wobbles like this. So then therefore, as a punter, you want to keep the football in the air as long as possible, basically, such that your team can get downfield and then ultimately tackle whoever it is that catches the punt. So you know it's been a good punt when, for example, the receiving team has to call a fair catch. In other words, the football is remaining in the air for a long period of time, very nearly as a projectile. That gives you enough time to run downfield and defend against the catch, defend against the receiving team. That's why you see so many fair catches being called in the game. You know that when that happened, that the punter punted a good punt. Okay, and then you have, for example, the kickoff and the field goal. This is where you have to be very accurate in your kick because when you kick as a field goal or you kick a kickoff, then the ball is wobbling like this. When it's wobbling like this, even though, yes, it has a greater rotational inertia than when you spiral it, the force of air resistance exerted upon it is much greater. Therefore, it is hard, if you will, to kick a field goal. It is hard to kick a kickoff for those reasons. So depending upon how the game is set up, whether or not you're punting or kicking a field goal or if you're kicking a kickoff, the advantage is to one team or the other. Okay, and then we have the baseball. Okay, let me get rid of this. Okay, so with respect to the baseball, let me specifically describe what happens when you pitch a baseball. Okay, so let's say that the baseball is like so. Let's say that specifically the velocity vector of the baseball is into the board. So V into board. Okay, and then let's say that when you throw the baseball, you rotate it. Right here is an axis of rotation. So imagine me taking the baseball, holding it like so, throwing it in this direction into the board, but when I do, when I release it, I rotate the baseball like this. So it then travels through the air wall rotating like so. There's a slight difference in air pressure on one side of the ball as opposed to the other when this happens. If the velocity vector V is into the board and I rotate the baseball like this, this side of the baseball is at a slightly lower air pressure than this side of the baseball is. There's a slightly greater air pressure here. It has to do with the rotation of the ball pushing the air, if you will. There's a slightly greater air pressure here than there is over here on this side of the ball. There's a lower pressure. So there's a pressure differential. This pressure differential then causes a sideways force on my diagram in this direction. This sideways force is referred to as the Magnus force. The Magnus force is the cause of all breaking pitches. The perfect example of this, of course, is the curveball. This is the cause the cause of all breaking pitches, as they're called. So let's say that you're watching a baseball game and you're watching the pitcher pitch the ball. The perspective of the camera, basically pointed at the picture and then pointed at the catcher, makes it look like to your eye that when you watch the pitch, that the break, if you will, of the curveball only occurs at the very end. That's not the case. It's actually breaking the whole time. 
because as I release the white baseball and spin it like so, the magnet force is acting on it the whole time that it's rotating in the air. It's just the perspective of the camera itself that makes it look like that the baseball only breaks at the last moment. But if you were the batter watching the baseball come at you, you're gonna see it break the whole time. However, when a really good pitcher throws a curveball, they try to throw the curveball with a large speed. Therefore, you really only see the break, if you will, at the last moment when you're the hitter, and then therefore it's not very easy to tell whether or not the pitcher threw a fastball at you, where the rotation of the ball is slight, or if the pitcher threw a curveball at you, where it's basically breaking the whole time. But if the breaking pitch is thrown very slowly, then you can pretty easily see the break over the entire path of the baseball. Okay, what about a knuckleball? Well, with a knuckleball, what the pitcher does is they basically grip the ball like this in some manner, and then when they throw it, it's almost as if they just push it out of their hand. And then when they push it out of their hand, they're basically pushing it out of their hand such that it doesn't rotate at all. And this usually occurs at a slow speed. Usually the speed of a breaking pitch like this, a knuckleball, is usually in the neighborhood of only like 40 or 50 miles per hour. And then as the baseball passes through the air, it's basically at the mercy of the wind, first of all, because it's not rotating and then therefore there's no magnus force. But the force of air resistance also does act upon the baseball, but it does so in different ways, depending upon whether or not the force is exerted upon the seam or the flat area and so on. So because of all of these different variables, when you don't rotate the baseball, it is that much harder to control. And it's basically at the mercy of the air that is passing through as it goes from the pitcher's hand, ultimately to home plate. So that's just a qualitative understanding of basic physics, of you, if you will, of what happens with a football and a baseball.